what was interesting was that when Trump was in power and he started this whole thing, everyone thought, well, he's an evil man. He's this horrible, horrible individual. And he, he started this and he doesn't care. And everyone had so much hope that when Biden comes in, he's going to reverse this decision. He will put conditions on this peace process. He will do something or he will, he will just extend the withdrawal date to make sure there's a meaningful discussion. And actually he made it a thousand times worse. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. A brilliant and important guest we have for you today. She is the founder of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Shabnam Nasimi, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you for having me. It's so great to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's obviously a very difficult time at the moment as we speak. Before we get into the issue of Afghanistan itself, uh, talk to us a little bit about who you are. What is your story? What is your journey through life? How do you find yourself sitting here talking to us? Thank you. Um, well, originally, my family came to the UK in 1999, which was just two years prior to the 9-11 attacks. And they had studied in the former Soviet Union, um, um, then directly affiliating themselves with, with Russia and its its system. Great um, people. Very. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as a result of that, um, they knew that um, they were directly targeted by the Taliban and its regime, um, who do not agree with anyone who have Western values or I guess seen as with Soviet Union, people thought that you were an atheist um, who didn't believe in Islam. Um, and, um, you know, that's how you're targeted. And, and that's the same case today as well. But, um, you know, we grew up in, in London in Southeast. Um, and I have two y younger sisters and one brother. Um, and I think with most minority ethnic groups, um, from a young age, when you know you've come from a country that has very little opportunity, um, you work a lot harder, a lot, a lot hard, harder to um, to get to a point where you're recognised and you're heard. And I think particularly for Afghans, it's even more so um, because we, we come from one of the most war-torn countries in the world, uh, one of the most impoverished, that um, in comparison to even our neighbours of Pakistan, Iran and India and Central Asia, um, Afghans tend to struggle a lot more um, in terms of integration and getting adjusted in the societies they end up resettling in. So yeah, it's not been an easy journey. Um, I'm proud of where I am today, but I'll, we'll get on to that in a bit. Um, but that's sort of my very my story in a very in a nutshell. And your family escaped uh, Afghanistan and came here as refugees via a bunch of countries, didn't they? They did. It was the normal route that refugees normally take. You sort of give up your, your life, your home, your belongings, your family, and you trek through Pakistan or either Iran and move across to, uh, to Europe, first getting into arriving at Greece, Italy, France, Dover, and then the UK. And we actually came in a container at, at the time. So it was a container that... Um, uh, was carried in one of those ferries that c comes to the UK from Calais. Um, and it was sort of pitch black. Um, the only thing, the only thing I can remember from that point is um, it was very difficult to breathe. And my, my dad wanted to make sure that we were calm. Um, so he had matchsticks and kept lighting them up so that we could, he could, we, we could see a little bit. Um, and it was only me and my sister at the time. Uh, my, my younger brother and sister were born here. But um, yeah, no, it's not, it's not a journey you take out of choice. Mm. That's, that's, um, that's definitely the case, and it's something that a lot of people feel that you're giving up your dignity and your respect to come in that way to another country. And I think it's probably with the current situation in Afghanistan, um, it's really important to stress that what's happening and the fact that a lot of countries are now offering resettlement, um, that it's not out of choice. No one really wants to leave your, your home, your comfort to, to go somewhere else and, and in such difficult situations. Well, look, we'll talk about the refugee issue probably later on, but let, let's let's just go back for people watching this. They've seen Afghanistan in the news. Let's be honest, most people in the West have absolutely couldn't find Afghanistan on a map, right? So just take us back through the last 20 years particularly. So your family left in 99. Soon after that, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, attack the, the Twin Towers in New York, uh, destroy them, kill thousands of people in America. America 
retaliates, you could say, or goes into Afghanistan to deal with the problem of the terrorists that were being allowed to set up bases there to train, etc. Talk us through that and everything that's happened since so that we have a good grounding for the conversation that we have. Sure. So um, on the year of 2001, um, the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, which was led by the former Ahmad Shah Massoud and Dostum, one is from the Tajik ethnic group and the other from the Uzbek ethnic group, both actually began fighting against the Taliban um, quite, you know, form a strong resistance and a movement. Um, then, as a result, the Taliban collapsed in their regime, and that's when the U.S. stepped in and, and provided that aircraft, the logistics, the power, the, the, the forces to help Afghans completely remove the Taliban and oust them um, from from Afghanistan. And the mission was a was primarily targeted at, uh, targeted at um, destroying the Al Qaeda and its networks and the Taliban as well, um, which was partially successful. Uh, of course, you can't really get rid of an, an extremist group completely. There is, you know, leaving even a seed of them um, does mean that they, you know, they will continue to flourish. And with the Taliban, they're trained, particularly on the other side of the border of Pakistan, uh, in madrasas, really extreme Islamic schools from a very young age. So um, it's why they've been able to return today. But going back to what happened in 2001, once that NATO and the international community came and went in, the whole world's attention was on Afghanistan. Trillions in, in aid was spent, um, money, interest, effort, sacrifices. I mean, 2,000 American forces died and 450 British soldiers died. So people made heavy sacrifices in Afghanistan and effort um, and a lot of time. Uh, because they wanted to not only remove the extremism and the terrorist groups, but also nation build. Um, and so the mission wasn't focused on just uh, destroying extremism, but also creating society and a system. So when they went into Afghanistan, they had to start from scratch. There was practically no infrastructure, no health, health system, no education, no schools. The roads had to be fixed. Everything. It was a blank canvas. So... What, the reason why this last few days have been so difficult um, is because if you had just gone in there to remove the Taliban and you were only fighting with them, it would have been a different story. But you went in there to develop a country. You oh, developed yeah. a nation that had hope, that were fighting for something. And in the last 20 years, Afghanistan progressed incredibly. It wasn't perfect. I don't think any country anywhere in the world would say that in 20 years, they became a developed country um, and, and changed. Um, Europe wasn't made <laughs> in 20 years, neither was the US or anywhere else. But 20 years in Afghanistan, because so much attention was put into, into the country all at once, schools were built, there was almost 40, 50% of the students in universities and schools were girls. And there were female journalists, um, there were actresses, there were musicians, singers that were performing with without scarves, which is uh, which was quite extraordinary. One of my Iranian friends that saw videos of female um, act, um, singers in Afghanistan performing, they said, well, "We can't do that in Iran without a scarf. How come you guys can, women can perform and sit amongst men without without a, a head cover?" Um, so it was astonishing for Iranians, and it was also astonishing for a lot of Central Asian and Pakistani countries, as, uh, Pakistan as well, uh, sort of South Asian countries, because they said that you had such a free press. You were able to criticize the president, you were able to criticize the government and officials without any um, consequences. Whereas most of these countries, uh, it's not the same. Even, you know, Russia today is still, um, it's, you, you can't really speak against Putin. A nice personally. little dig at my people. <laughs> yeah. there, right? You can, just don't drink the tea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but Afghanistan, yeah, that, that was the case. You know, I, I traveled to Afghanistan a few times over the last 20 years, every year or every other year, visited family, visited friends. And there were points where I went out um, and walked outside without any family members. In the beginning, I was a bit terrified. I thought maybe my uncle or my aunt or my cousin had to go with me because I didn't know I was a bit unfamiliar, and I thought. But um, it, it slowly, eventually, I could, I could just walk around anywhere on my own. So that was the progress. Uh, women were outside in cafe shops and restaurants, sitting like we are today, comfortably. Um, and that's been taken away. So that's, what, the last 20 years, what was created was a nation that was moving forward 
And one, more importantly, 75% of Afghanistan is under the age of 25, approximately. The majority of the new generation today never lived under the Taliban rule. All they knew was the last 20 years. So this was a new generation, like a complete new chapter, starting fresh, um, who have only seen progress and moving up. Um, so the mentality changed, the psyche changed. Um, people lived in under Western liberal, liberalized de democrat democratic values. And I think what one thing that people fail to understand is that it wasn't forced upon them. You know, a lot of stop the coalition or stop the war, sort of war coalition groups and people who are against the intervention say, you know, we can't go there and impose our system on others. It doesn't work. In countries like Afghanistan, yes, you've got to understand that this is a tribal country. There's lots of different sects, lots of different groups. Uh, you've got to embrace culture and, and the people. But you went there and you introduced democracy and people wanted it. They didn't kick you out. They didn't force you out. They didn't fight with you. They embraced it really strongly. They loved living in a free society. So it wasn't imposed. Um, they accepted it. So to sort of su to, su to summarize, a lot was done. A lot had changed. A lot of sacrifice was made. Um, and so this is why the last few days and the consequences of the withdrawal has been so hard to accept. And before we get into that, the question I really wanted to ask is, who are the Taliban? Because people often, we talk about them, but no one really explains who they are, where they're from, their belief system. Why is it that they want to, you know, overthrow you know, the, the current government? And how were they in power before? The Taliban are an extreme Islamist group. Um, they are tribal in their mentality. So there is an honor code that they go through, sort of their practice. So in terms of ethnicity, majority of them are from the Pashtun ethnic group of Afghanistan. Today, they're a little bit more diverse. They're recruiting from all, all, all sects, but originally from that, that ethnic group. And they live in, in sort of societies that are very patriarchal. Men are allowed outside, girls aren't. Um, girls do not have, or women do not have the right to study, to work. Um, it, their responsibility is basically to look after their family members and their husband and to produce um, children. Um, and their system and what they want for Afghanistan is basically a very, very fundamental form of Islam that allows no freedom. Um, in some ways, I feel they, they're trying to act like God and they, they think they are God, you know, punishing a woman who steps outside without the right clothes. And if um, she is hurt to have had any relations with a man, any type, even a conversation without justification, without a proper sort of legal um, court proceeding in terms of finding out whether adultery, for instance, actually happened or anything like that, they would stone a, a, a woman. Um, and I mean, I, in terms of the religious aspect of it, I don't think I can go into too detail to sort of understand what um, script they're using and, and the different types of Islamic practices. But what I do know is that there, there isn't, a, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the Taliban, it's very similar to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but the only difference is that they're very tribal in their mentality. Um, and they're a group that in Afghanistan have come primarily from Pakistan and are also uh, trained in madrasas from a very young age, um, very young, so teenagers. And so they're so brainwashed that when, by the time they, you know, uh, um, grow up to about 20, 30 years old, they know nothing other than violence and brutality and, 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 and killing. So it's basically an ex a fundamental extremist Islamic group. So what you have is modern society, well, very modern for what we know for, from Afghanistan, and then we have the Taliban. How is it that the Taliban, with less resources, without the American dollars, without American technology, have managed to overthrow the Afghan army backed by the US, the UK, et cetera, et cetera? Well, this is the question that's been asked a few times this 
past week, even Biden actually said, well, why are we going to fight when the Afghan forces aren't fighting? Um, first of all, NATO actually ha haven't been fighting since 2014. They've been their non-combat role. Uh, they've simply been there to provide morale, support, logistics, and training. Unfortunately, though, Afghanistan has have had um, a very corrupt government um, in that the support that the government should have been given the armed forces wasn't available. So a lot of soldiers, from what I was hearing, were not receiving their salaries, they weren't being funded properly, they weren't being supported by the government either. So they were quite isolated and left alone. And then in the last year or so, when NATO and the US announced they were leaving, the Taliban were on their own fighting with neither the government's support nor NATO's. I mean, the, a lot of people question and say, well, if we haven't been able to create a strong army in the last 20 years, well, where did all that money go? The first couple of years, I guess the first 10 years, was when you, the, the intense training was, was happening. In the latter half of, of this two decades, they were given the logistics and the support. Again, I don't think there are, there's any military in the world that would have been able to do what they have done in the last 20 years. So you can't just take away the logistics, the aircraft, the equipment, and say, OK, here you go, get on with it. And that's practically what was done. You took everything from them and you let them fight on their own with, with very little equipment, let, no weapons. Hold on, Sam. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. What about the Taliban? It's not like they have, you know, American warplanes and drones and, and sophisticated equipment. Sophisticated. I think they're funded very well, though. They're funded really well. Um, the, the, most of the, force, uh, the soldiers in the Afghan army are coming, come from very impoverished homes. They're very poor. Um, a lot of my own father's family are are, are, are are serving in the army. And from what I hear, it was either become a soldier or die from hunger because there was no other choice. To join was to simply be able to make an income. So they weren't all very skilled. Um, it wasn't a choice. Or motivated. Or motivated. It was simply to, to make a living. Um, and I think in th this last couple of months... Um, there's a lot of political um, issues with this as well in that province after province was just given to the Taliban quite easily. People weren't fighting. There wasn't resistance. A lot of soldiers knew that if they fought and and there was a lot of sentiment that the Taliban were going to win. There was a lot of morale. You saw, saw it in the media. I think also that worsened the, the situation in that when you're saying that they're going to win, you're already changing people's mindset. So they're not going to have the confidence to continue fighting. Um, so it was actually a conversation that I had with the Foreign Office recently where we were working on seeing if we can do a counter-Taliban propaganda campaign. Because by talking about the Taliban winning, you're already instilling that narrative on people's minds and people will just run away rather than fight. And I think it's the same with the soldiers as well. Uh, they just believe that it's going to happen. Why fight and, and die? Um, if no one really cares and no one's going to help us. And today, any soldier that uh, is captured by the Taliban is killed in a really, really brutal way. And there have already been cases uh, that, that I've seen, videos that I've seen. Um, so I'm sure many of those soldiers knew that because we, we were fighting directly against the Taliban and we were fighting for a foreign-backed uh, army, um, that we will, will be killed. So a lot of them just ran away. And I, I think details are important. When you say killed in a really brutal way, what are we actually talking about here? Well, actually, I saw a video today uh, of a um, army general being caught, his hand tied, blindfolded, uh, on his knees, and shot about 100 times uh, in Kandahar. Um, so it's it's... It's just very difficult to even imagine, It's so, to even speak about. Um, another friend of mine who served in Afghanistan, two tours, um, posted on social media that 12 men that he had been working with um, have been executed in, in Lashkar in Kandahar as well. Um, so that's already started. And, and the brutality and the way they kill um, other family members that I know and friends, um, the soldiers have had to go into hiding, but the Taliban are going door to door patrolling and do, how, doing house searches. So they'll go into the house, 
they'll look around, they'll see who's at home, they'll um, take the cars um, and any property. And there was actually one house that were going to take the house as well, um, but they found a way to negotiate, excuse me, um, and 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 allow them to the family members to stay. But if that um, soldier was captured um, and they're clearly looking for him, um, it, he would face the same type of savage brutality and, and murder. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Well, if you do, then Easy DNS are the company for you. Easy DNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, deplatform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows a bit about that. So will you in a second. Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and incredible customer support. They're in your corner, no matter what the world throws at you, unless it's your ex-girlfriend, in which case you're on your own. You'd know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to Easy DNS right now. All you've got to do is head over to easydns.com forward slash triggered and use our promo code, which is of course triggered as well, and you will get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, that tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. That being the case, how can you possibly have a modern country when you have these types of religious extremists? I mean, what, what do you do with these people? Is can, can you rehabilitate them? Do you simply have to wipe them off the surface of the earth? Or are you constantly going to be in this quasi-civil war with them? Well, it's a difficult one because a lot of people argue that we, the West made the mistake of not including the Taliban in peace talks right from the beginning um, and seeing whether they would be willing to be part of Afghan society, have a part in this government um, and start to uh, be assimilated, integrated into the police and the army um, and work alongside um, others. I don't know whether that would have been the case because clearly they have no interest in working or compromising at all. Um, in the last few days, they said, we, un we want unconditional power. Initially, they, uh, the agreement was there'll be a transitional government for six months where someone will just step in until an agreement is made in terms of it will be a 50-50 arrangement, whose who's responsibility will be, you know, what. But they said, we're not going, we're not coming back without 100%. Um, and that's it. And we want the Emirate, um, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, nothing less than that. So it's a difficult question to answer. I think probably a lot of people thinking that with a group like that existing, if we stay 20, 30, 40, 50 years, if they're still going to come back and retrain and regroup, what's the point? Mm. But I think if we had stayed for longer, like we have in, you know, I know the US are still in South Korea. You know, we stayed for a very long time in Germany. We're in Cyprus and you've got Hong Kong. You know, we've got army and um, soldiers all around. But by persisting and enduring, you develop a society that eventually can, can fight on its own. I think 20 years was too early. Had you given it 40 years or probably a little bit more than that, potentially it would, you would have created a society that was resilient and would have been, been able to stand on its own two feet and fight independently. But you pulled everything way too quickly, uh, expecting them to just deal with it on their own. Well, the, the counter argument, and a lot of people have made, including our, our, we've recorded the interview, but he will be our former guest because we had we recorded him before, uh, Ricky Bexan from the Henry Jackson Society. And he's written a piece in, the, in Spiked talking about the fact that actually many of the things that you've put, and of course you're entitled to put them to us, about the progress that's been made in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, is Western wishful thinking more than reality? For example, he quotes polls from only a few years ago, which show that 99% of Muslims in Afghanistan want Sharia law, 94% think that wives should always obey their husbands, 85% think the penalty for adultery should be stoning, and on and on we go. So if, we, if we've been in Afghanistan that long, and with all of the things that you've talked about, girls going to school in university, being free from wearing headscarf, whatever, 
really, have we made that much progress there? Has society moved on? Particularly, and maybe it's also, there's two questions in what I'm saying. That's the first part, have we made enough progress? And the second part is, is it maybe just a weakness of Western liberal democratic thinking that if you are an Islamic Islamist fundamentalist and you believe that if you sacrifice yourself on the battlefield, you're going to go to heaven where you're going to be surrounded by virgins and you're fighting against someone who's fighting for human rights and freedom, it's not quite a strong a motivating force to, to fight and to die and to sacrifice your life for something. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So t those two questions, talk to us about that. The first, I would say, if that was the case and we actually haven't made much of a difference, you wouldn't be seeing people fleeing today. If they wanted to live under such a system, why is it that you're constantly seeing videos of people running towards airplanes um, well, because they worked with the West and, now and most of them, be a lot of them haven't. Most of those people that that were running have hadn't worked with the West, and and they were just ordinary Afghans, mm. some who just wanted to get away. I think uh, one of the issues in the last couple of days that I've seen is that a lot of the people that were in the airport weren't actually from Kabul, and the majority weren't people who had fought and worked with the West. It were just ordinary Afghans who were trying to find an opportunity just to get into the airplane. Um, with no documents, no passport, anything like that. So if that was the case, they wouldn't be running. Um, and I, I say this, I think the other problem I'm having is that I come from Afghanistan, I have family, I have friends, I've traveled there. And yet when I hear people telling me that that country hasn't progressed or the mentality hasn't, I dispute that because I feel like we need to hear from Afghans a lot more. Mm -hmm. And that's the other problem with this is that when I was talking about the fact that Afghans are a very marginalized group, even in the West, their voices aren't heard very much. I mean, you've got Caribbean, you've got the black community, you've got South Asian, when I talk about South Asia, talk about Indian and Pakistanis, and so many others. And a lot of them have, of course, been here much, much longer in Britain. Afghans are newly arrived, you know, 15, 20 years. You're being heard now, Shabu. You're right <laughs> Which is here. Great. You... It, took, it took us 20 years, yes. We, we've, we've come to the point Look, now. We've only been doing this for three years, you know. So we, you're the yeah. first Afghan on the show, I believe, yeah. and you're very welcome here. But look, what I'm talking about is opinion polls, right? This yeah. isn't he said, she said, etc. And of course, there will be people fleeing war, there will be people fleeing the Taliban, there will be people who don't want to live under Sharia law, as your parents and your family didn't. But has... What I'm asking is, has Afghan society really moved on as much as we'd like to think? I think I'm not going to disagree that it, Afghanistan is a very complex society. And I think I mentioned a little bit earlier that it's a tribal society mm. uh, that lives under tribal practices. Um, and, you know, that the woman's role is not out in the public Um that, you know, women should have more than, you know, five children and, you know, very religious, very, very fundamental. Um, but it doesn't, it, it takes time to help people get out of that mindset. The, the other problem is that a lot of the change were in, in cities mm -hmm. like Kabul. That's what I was going to ask were, you about. And rural, there was a not, there wasn't much intervention and these sort of big NGOs were being funded um, by foreign governments but their work has was been delivered in the capital cities. And I, I, I find the issue with that as well. We weren't actually funding community-led activities by activists in all across Afghanistan um, on a grassroots level. This was all done by Save the Children or Oxfam, all these major organizations that um, were working with community groups and civic society activists in cities with well-established groups already with people that spoke English. Um, they, I guess they wanted, it was easier for them, wasn't it? You know, to work with people that understood the system, that they could communicate with them. Uh, it would have been a lot harder to go to a rural place where English wasn't spoken and then trying to deal and figure out how to work around that. So, you know, they took the easier option uh, and the easiest way out to, 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 um, to change uh, and bring about uh, change in Afghanistan. So that could have been one of the cause for the, poll, the fact that the poll said that a lot of people were still quite traditional in their mindset. But it takes time. It really does. It's not an easy... I think people fail to understand how backward Afghanistan really was and probably still is, in, in, like you said, in, in rural areas. There is no country around the world um, that has suffered from 40 
over 40 years of conflict from 1978 ongoing mm -hmm. that does not have any system. I remember when I first went, even in 2001, there was sewer, sewers out in the open. You know, people mm -hmm. would go to the toilet and it would come out into the road. Um, the roads needed fixing. The houses are very old, made out of clay and, and mud. So to think that you can change a country like that, that is tribal, that is traditional, that is practically living in the first century so quickly, is very naive. It's something, you know, we've, we've, we've failed to really study Afghanistan properly, first of all, to understand its people, its culture, where we've started, what kind of country we're actually intervening in. And for example, we will compare it to Iraq, but Iraq was a very developed country yes. before Saddam. Yeah. Yeah. And so was Syria. <laughs> yeah. You know, Afghanistan's not the same. It's right. completely different. And the interventions were different. We were fighting extremism in Iraq and Syria um, and fighting Daesh. But before our interventions, before Saddam, before Assad, um, these were very, very modern, westernized, liberal societies. And stable societies. Mm. Very stable. stable. Mm. Business, economy, freedom. Afghanistan's not the same. And I, you know, what I try to emphasize to anyone that compares is please don't compare because Afghanistan is a unique case. It's never been a developed society. And you weren't there to fix a small problem. You were trying, you were there to fix decades of All right. a problem. Let me ask you one more bad cop question yeah. uh, before Francis uh, jumps in, which is with all of that being the case, and I recognize that from what I know about uh, that part of the world. I mean, you weren't like hearing this, but there'll be a lot of people listening to you going, well, I mean, we were there for 20 years. We spent two trillion dollars on, on on trying to build up this country to make it a more Western, more liberal society. I mean, how how much more money are British and American taxpayers? How many more lives? How you know? It's. It, it, I'm not saying this is an easy decision, but that is how people will be thinking. I mean, how, another twenty years, forty years, six, how long does it take to take someone in a rural area of Afghanistan? Uh, who's maybe never seen electricity, let alone modern Western liberal. How long does it take to get that to where you can just leave it and the Taliban aren't going to come back and take over? Because quite a lot of people are quite happy with what they're going to do. Oh, I understand what you're saying. And the reason why those people ask those questions is because they think this is an Afghan crisis. Mm -hmm. They don't see this as a regional or a global crisis. Mm -hmm. In, on the, in the 21st century, we shouldn't even have a country that lives like that. It's a human issue. We need to actually ask questions why even a country like that exists, first of all. Second of all, as we've seen from past history, what happens in Afghanistan affects the West directly. It's one of the reasons why you know we went there in, in, in there in the first place. We were trying to ensure that our shores and our, our land is safe from extremism. So we had to go there to bring stability it affects us directly here. So you're not going there to fix their problem. You're there to fix them so that it benefits you and your safety and your security. And, you know, thirdly, Afghanistan's quite, you know, positioned in a really important um, geographical area. You've got Pakistan and India, which is a former British Raj. You've got Iran, which is no friend of, of the West. <laughs> You've got Central Asia, which is under Soviet Union control. You've got China. So... It's a very important spot. Mm. If when you're there, strategically, you can maintain order anywhere. By leaving, you've left a vacuum, and already China and Russia are saying they yeah. they're going to step in and 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 fund the Taliban. Um, you know, China's developing that new Silk uh, Belt Road across the region in order to um, to feed their sort of economic domination ambitions they have. So, you know, it's not a small matter. And I think when you fail to understand the political side of this, the economic side of the security, um, the diplomatic aspects of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan intervention, that's when you'll understand that you're not there fixing someone else's problem. You're there to fix your own problem. But in addition to that, you're also trying to give the Afghan people some hope and peace and freedom. Um, you know, Afghans have never kicked out anyone by force. It's always been military intervention and political sort of games being played in, in the land. Um, they are very a, a vulnerable group. They're very marginalized. They're very, you know, 
I'm sure hopefully, well, you're not going to be able to travel now if you haven't in the last 20 years, but let's see what happens. But if you do travel, you'll see how simple they live. Their lives are very simple. Um, and I think the only wish I would have had is the political elite in Afghanistan, which is less than 1%, um, are the ones who have caused this problem as well. The majority of the Afghan population have no hand in what's going on. A lot of them are illiterate, have no understanding of what's happening around them. Um, it's the political elite who most of them have come from the West in the last 20 years, actually. That's the other problem, is that you have a president and ministers who've been educated and lived their whole lives in the US, and the UK, and Europe, step in and say, we're going to fix Afghanistan, by, but never going through the struggle and the pain of, of the war. So how can they really be in touch with what's happening? And as you've seen, most of them have actually left, uh, abandoning the country without any fight. Uh, people are very, very infuriated with the president who left even without a notice of resignation. Um, Managed to take about $136 million in cash with them, though. Yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, it's traumatic and it's hard to accept that this is... I, I think we made huge mistakes right from the beginning as well by working with people who, um, were, you know, it was easier for the West to work with people like them because, again, there were Western in individuals who had grown up and studied in the West and it's a lot easier to communicate and deal with them. But I think they, there's not, there wasn't a lot of energy and hard work in getting actual people in Afghanistan, like the actual Afghans, get them to a point where they can be leaders. The investment wasn't made to make new leaders the investment was on existing people who you've just brought from the West to take up these positions um, and who wouldn't last really because, you know, you've got a dual passport. You, you'll run away any, any moment when, when, when cat catastrophe strikes. Don't you think as well, Shabnam, that the widespread corruption made the society fundamentally unsustainable? You can't have society where people aren't getting paid because every, all the money's getting stolen. Oh, absolutely. I agree. Um, it's something I've been campaigning against, and I've raised a number of times that there needs to be a lot more monitoring uh, of funding that goes in. Um, it, it wouldn't have been difficult for, for example, the UK to set up a body that would ensure that any money that goes in, where it goes, who the, who it goes to, you know, you gave money to to a government, and it wasn't just you know the UK; it was Europe and the US, and and the world pledged billions of, of pounds. Um, to Afghanistan without surveillance or, or, or a system or monitoring system of, of where it goes and how who it goes to. And, and particularly, you know, people that were in government, any contracts that came in, any of you know, there was a lot of opportunity, honestly. I think Afghanistan had, if we, for example, went to Afghanistan in the last 20 years, we would have been millionaires by now. There was so much opportunity. Contracts were being given, to, uh, offered and development opportunities. Mm -hmm. What happened, though, is a lot of that was given to close circles. So, you know, you've got the president, he will give it to his brother or his son or a relative, and they would have this multi-million contract to develop a factory or, a, you know, buildings and roads um, and would pocket half of that. Um, and, um, I mean, that's the way it worked. And that, I think I, the fault is both ways, both the fact that we had a very corrupt government um, an irresponsible one. And then also the fact that the, the international community gave aid without any bother, like, where is it going? And I think also that's what's probably infuriated the British public, for instance. You're spending all of our taxpayers' money, but you're not monitoring where it's going, who it's going to. And a lot of that money didn't go to the people that should have had it. And that's the other argument over the fact that if we, if we haven't been able to develop Afghanistan in 20 years, then what hope is there for any more? But that money didn't go to Afghans. It didn't go to the everyday people that, you're, that we should have been working with to change their mentality, to, to allow their girls to go to school, to change their understanding of how society runs and to, to allow them to become more educated. Um, so if the money isn't going to the everyday Afghan and it's going in the pockets of the elite or the people that live in capital cities, how could you expect there to be any shift in mentality or understanding? 
Um, so there were huge failures. I'm not saying it was perfect. There was a lot of mistakes that were made over the last 20 years in m- many aspects in, in terms of aid, in terms of um, ha- understanding the society, understanding the fact that there are different ethnic groups. I mean, ethnicity was another huge problem in Afghanistan. You've got the you've got Tajiks, you've got Uzbeks, uh, Pashtuns, uh, Hazaras, all of these ethnic groups also wanted to be represented and included in the process. Um, Afghanistan is a very centralized um, system, it has a um, every power, everything was in, in the centralized government. For example, the police would, uh, sorry, the president would even recruit police officers or the teachers. I mean, that's how, how much control the president had. No one would be able to make a decision without him. And, Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so people felt neglected, people felt underrepresented. They felt that this was not a system that, w- that was inclusive. Um, was there a bit of resentment as well, the fact that, you know, hang on a second, you know, none of the people from this country are actually being truly represented because you've just flown someone in from a, from America. So didn't they, wasn't there a large part of them that just saw this as a puppet regime? Oh, for sure. They, uh, the, major- the majority of, of the country did, did think that. They thought, you know, you've got a president who actually made a few mistakes as well. One was actually when he was, um, there was a prayer um, during Eid, I think it was. He didn't know how to pray, um, sort of the Islamic way of, you know, going down or there was an error there. Um, and then there was also, I think he recited one of the um, Islamic verses incorrectly. Incorrectly, So he made a few mistakes. And I think probably why he ran away so quickly was that he knew that if he fell in the hands of the Taliban, he would have been done. Um, but yes, that, that was the, the, the major problem and something I've been dealing with in that a lot of Afghans would say, how can we trust the government that has not actually come from within the society? And these are all people, you know, the national security advisor was came from the UK. Um, most of the ministers were either from the US or from the UK. President Ghani was from the US. These are very well educated. And and, um, and Karzai before him. And Karzai was from the US as well. So really in the last 20 years, there wasn't actually anyone, there were right. very many people that were from Afghanistan and had lived there and raised there um, that, that were in government. Hey, Constantin, do you love trigonometry? Of course, incredible interviews, hilarious live streams, hard hitting satire, plus my handsome jawline. Whatever takes away from your hairline. But if you do love trigonometry and you want to support us, there's only one place to do that, and that's on Locals. Yes, Locals is a brilliant platform that has been incredibly supportive to our show and other problematic creators. The great thing about Locals is that it's a community for people who love trigonometry. That's right. It's a place for you to hang out with like-minded people, share thoughts, memes, and discuss the show. You can enjoy it for free, but it also gives you the option of supporting us for as little as $7 a month. And if you want to give more, you can. We have incredible rewards for our higher tier supporters as well. We've got everything from mugs, monthly group calls, and one-on-two chats with me and KK. Get in. Join our community by hitting the link in the description and the pinned comment below. See you there, guys. I've got to be honest with you, Shabnam, as, as, as much empathy as I feel for the people of Afghanistan, of course I do. You're not... You're not convincing me that the US and the UK should stay. It just sounds like such a nightmare. And how are you gonna how are you gonna distribute funds without an elite? And how are you do, do you see what I'm saying? It just sounds like such a massive mess. It was a mess because we didn't do it the right way the first time. Mm. I think staying, listening, understanding what Afghanistan is, what kind of nation it is, listening to the very people that we've ignored for so long it would have been a shift and a change. And I'm not convincing you because you're still looking at it in terms of the nation building part of it. Mm. We need to, we need, I understand there were failures when it comes to the country itself, Mm. but when it comes to British foreign policy. Oh, that bit I agree with you on, the the security aspect. Security, economic, diplomatic around. Yeah, 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 I agree. But by staying in Afghanistan, despite its failures, you were giving back whilst gaining a lot more. Yeah, I, I get that. So, yes, it, it takes a lot of effort. It, it's difficult. And my 
suggestions and recommendations have always been let's work with the communities that have been mud- sort of isolated for so long, the people that you do not and have not consulted with, even in the last three years of, of the peace process, no one's actually, none of the um, the negotiations, whether it was in Doha or in Russia or in Iran, the, C, the you know high level uh, meetings, they were all with the top political elite, you know, Karzai and his group and the people that were in government. I, we, there was no reps from the youth. There was no rep- representatives from the young women, um, the, the new generation, the different ethnic groups. So, so many failures. And I think it came out of either comfort or the fact that you've worked with one group so for so long, you just, you rely on them to do everything. Right. That, the, that, that it takes a lot more effort and time and management to, tr- to train a, um, individuals who aren't used to Western ways of working, I guess, or can't mm-hmm. speak English very well, or just aren't familiar with how to uh, negotiate, how to speak, how to be politically educated. So it, I know it takes a lot more time and effort, but I think we took the easier way out by working with a group that just was familiar for us, was uh, a group that we've either trained or worked with in the West and have formed existing relationship with. So L- Let me ask you about another, what you might describe as a simple way, not necessarily easy way out, but the one that, that I'm starting to see in the British media being taken. We saw only a couple of days ago, I retweeted this clip of, uh, I think he's the chief of the general staff, so he's the head of the British army on Sky News. He's being interviewed, and I think it's Kay Burley asks him about uh, the Taliban, you know, how do we deal with this enemy? And he says, oh, we mustn't call them the enemy uh, Mm -hmm. because we wouldn't want to, that they promised to have an inclusive approach to... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It seems to me like the West is considering taking what you will certainly, and I consider a very cynical approach, which is saying, look, the Taliban have taken over, right? This is who, who's going to be there. And in terms of our geostrategic interest, they're the people we have to deal with now. Like, And they're going to do what they're going to do, and it's horrible, and we're going to put hashtags on Instagram and whatever. But the reality is we're going to deal with these people. We're going to bribe them or threaten them or do whatever we need to do to, to get them not to harbor terrorists. And apart from that, Look, what are you going to do? Is that, do you think what's going to happen here? It's something I don't want to happen. No, obviously, no one um, wants it to happen. But I fear, and yeah. you're right, um, the fact that we we withdrew from Afghanistan so quickly, we took US lead here um, by claiming this was a US-led intervention. It had nothing to do with us. And, um, you know, they made the call and we just had to follow and we couldn't do this on our own. I, you know, I get that, but... To where, where does global Britain come into this? Or where does this influential humanitarian, leading humanitarian actor that we are around the world come into this? And the fact that we we have a history, uh, a proud history of doing things like this on our own. Why is it suddenly we've become so reliant on the US, first of all? Second of all, what's difficult for me, I think, as, as someone from Afghanistan is accepting that we've withdrawn militarily, but if you're going to withdraw politically and diplomatically and human in terms of humanitarian way as well, I think that's that's shameful to only think of your political interest in something like this and not the human side of this. Um, it, it is catastrophic. You know, we... I don't want the, the Taliban to be, first of all, seen as a legitimate government. But if even if it is, I expect that once that you've done this, you this catastrophe has always happened, already happened. But the 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 least that I would expect is that you would monitor what's happening, you will keep an eye out, you will pressure them to not go back into their old ways, um, and you will hold them to account. How? How do you pressure the Taliban not to go into their old ways? How do you do that? Well, I mean, you, I mean, you work, you develop a relationship with them. Of course, that's important. Mm. You've got to engage with mm. them. Um, but by ensuring that, you know, there are repercussions for what, if if they do go back, there are... So you have to threaten them that you're going to bomb them. Well, I was going to say back to the Stone Age. I think that's but... what the US has said that it would do. Um, that if, if, you, if you do allow the country to become a safe haven for mm. terrorism again, right. we will do that. Um, but... <laughs> It's sad because 
the country just goes through cycle after cycle of war. It's just never ending. I feel for the people because it's not their call. It's not, you know, it's of not course. something. Um, and sometimes we blame Afghans and say, you know, well, this is your country and you haven't been able to fix it. But it, it really isn't up to them. It's, not, it's never been up to the Afghan people. Um, Look, I know I'm coming across very yeah, cold yeah. and heartless, yeah, and yeah. it's because I am. But, <laughs> but, but, and I'm Russian. But, but actually, I'm asking you these questions because I know this is what yeah. people are thinking at home, right? Yeah. Uh, because that's what people are thinking, and uh, I think. We're seeing certainly the political leaders going down the path of going, well, look, the Taliban have taken over. We, like you said, we've got to engage with them. And if they start allowing terrorists coming into camps and whatever, we'll bomb you. But apart from that, I just think we've kind of lost any levers of influence, haven't we, at yeah. this point as the West? We have by allowing them to step in unconditionally. I think the mistakes were made when the peace process started. Um they asked for their prisoners to be released before they even started conversations. We agreed without negotiation. And imagine allowing a group of 5,000 prisoners to be released who were extremist terrorists, murderers, um, to be released from prison during the negotiations um, because they said, well, we're not going to sit around the table and talk to you and, until you do that. Um, that was an error. How could you give in to something like that so quickly? Totally. Hmm. Um, second of all, the US signs an agreement and says we're going to leave, but sets no conditions. And, and, and there's no talk about compromise, no talk about changing ideology, no talk about accepting this, this new Afghanistan. You just said, as long as you don't touch our, you know, US troops, you can do what you want. Um, it's shameful. I think the 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 my anger is more towards the US than anything else. Um, they've already shaped what what kind of country they want to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's ever going to trust them to be a friend or an ally again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Trump's isolationism um, uh, theory and, and the way he that he wanted Af America to be is what Biden is delivering on. Mm -hmm. I think what was interesting was that when Trump was in power and he started this whole thing. Everyone thought, well, he's an evil man. He's this hor horrible individual. And he, he started this and he doesn't care. And everyone had so much hope that when Biden comes in, he's going to reverse this decision. He will put conditions on this peace process. He will do something or he will, he will just extend the withdrawal date to make sure there's a meaningful discussion. And actually, he made it a thousand times worse. And every speech I hear from him about Afghanistan is so uncompassionate, so mis there's no understanding. There's no care for what happens to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that's what makes it this even worse. It's infuriating to listen to someone who just doesn't give any, who doesn't care. Um, and, and yeah, I think America has already sh shown us what, what kind of country it's going to be. And it's not going to be one that's a friend ever again, I think, to anyone. No one's going to trust the U.S. again. Who's going to trust that the U.S. will endure and persevere and stick it out when, when it's hard uh, anywhere else in the world. And I think this is where Britain can step in. This is where, when we talk about global Britain, when we talk about this new identity that we have outside of the EU, we want to be more global. We want to work with other countries outside of Europe. Uh, along comes with that a lot of responsibility. Um, mm. And I think potentially this will be an era for the, for the UK to show a lot more independence, a lot more leadership that doesn't rely on the US. And Shabnam, what it was the future now going to hold for Afghanistan? I think from, I mean, in terms of on the ground, it's going to be a very bleak future. Um, it's going to be a very difficult one. I, I know that for sure. And the Taliban rule, this is not going to be um, an easy um society. Um, I mean, we've, we saw the press conference from the Taliban, was it yesterday or the day before that? Uh, we know them saying that we've changed, we're going to allow women and girls to study and to work and that we will allow free press. But when it comes to what they've actually been doing in action, um, it's completely different. Um, we've, I've heard, you know, stories of, of women uh, being told they, they won't be working in, as, as presenters from Monday um, you know, women and girls have been told to go back home and, and not go to school. 
Um, and, you know, every argument they make is, you know, if you ask them if we'll have you, the people who have their rights, and they say, well, under Sharia law, you, you will. So what does, actually that, what does that mean? Because actually, the, the, the last 20 years, the government of Afghanistan actually had an Islamic constitution. It was an Islamic government. So what, what, why is Taliban Islamic uh, practices so different? What makes it different? That's still unclear. We still don't know what, what's the difference. But in terms of Afghanistan, uh, moving forward, it's going to be a very, very, very difficult next few years, if not next decade. Um, I do foresee that, that Britain will step in. I think potentially it will form a new coalition. Um, it's something that I'm hearing um, from, from MPs and from people who, you know, Tobias Elwood and Ben Wallace and a few others are looking at potentially seeing how the UK can step in without the US when the time comes and when it's needed. Um, and that is what I'd like to see. I think we there will be a time for sure that we will need to step in. Um, Afghanistan historically has never been a country where it's been on its own for, for too long. It's, um, you know, it, ha it hasn't been able to survive on its own. And it's one of the most dependent countries on foreign aid in the world. It doesn't, it can't survive. The institution and the infrastructure isn't there for it to have its own economy, to feed its people, to have a society and a system. It needs a foreign intervention to survive. And unfortunately, you know, that's not something I want. I'm sure that's not what the people of Afghanistan want. And I'm sure most of the people of Afghanistan didn't want NATO and the West to be stationed there forever. Um, but when you do go and you spend 20 years, why would you wash that down the drain and then potentially start again from scratch in the next 10 years or less? Um, it's just the reality of the country. It's the way it's always been. And what do you think China and Russia's role will be in this new Afghanistan? It's not going to be a good one, that's for sure. Um, it's, you know, China is, is looking at its own economic domination uh, in the region. So we'll be funding the Taliban, we'll be spending money in Afghanistan as long as potentially they agree not to uh, meddle in their plans. Um, you always ask the most fucking depressing <laughs> questions, mate. Um, and Russia, the same, I guess. Russian intervention has never been a positive one anywhere in the world. Correct. Um, so, what and, about Venezuela? How are they doing, mate? <laughs> Sorry, uh, Shabnam. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, and you know, you've got Iran on the other side, who is so anti-West yeah. um, that it will do anything to make sure that we don't go back in there. Um, and then you've got a proxy war with Pakistan who, you know, support, clearly have shown support to, to the Taliban. So uh, Afghanistan's very, you know, it's stuck in the middle. Unfortunately, it's, it's got neighbours that don't really have its best inter interest at heart. And even in the last couple of days and week, um, you know, let alone the West opening its borders, its neighbours haven't opened its borders. Um, no one's allowing anyone to get out to some Central Asian countries, Iran or anywhere else. And I think India has just started to see if it can issue visas. But what can you expect from anyone else when your own neighbours don't really want to let you through? So, yeah, it's it's going to be a difficult one. Well, look, you bring up an important issue and I wish we had more time, but we'll finish talking about the refugee situation. And obviously your family having come to the UK and all of you are doing very well. You're making a huge contribution. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I, I know you'll feel strongly about it personally, but there's also a bigger conversation to be had about it as well. So let's let's try and have that because, you know, my view is anyone who's who's worked with British or American forces deserves to be given the opportunity to be safe from what will certainly be reprisals and they're going to be murdered. Uh, the, but my, I've always, as a, as a first generation immigrant like you, I've always felt that it is the job of the British government to ensure that the immigration system is fair and is seen to be fair, including by the people of Britain. Yeah. Because when things like this happen, when there's a, a genuine refugees, and there will be, you know, a few tens of thousands. It's not a huge number by the standards of a country. But if you've had this kind of drip, drip, drip effect over the last 15, 20 years where people feel like it hasn't quite been calibrated correctly. I mean, Brexit, which I know you were a big fan of, partly was driven by the desire to control the immigration system. Do you fear now that some of the people who, I think you, you and I both agree, 
should be given the opportunity to come and to be safe and to be rewarded for, for risking their lives, essentially, to work with British and American forces are probably not going to be given that opportunity because of the system that we've had? Or do you think we will look after the people that we should look after? I think in terms of immigration, I completely agree with you. We've got to make sure that genuine asylum seekers who are fleeing war and conflict are given priority. Unfortunately, though, um, being part of the European Union has meant that over the years we've accepted people that were here as economic migrants and simply wanted a job uh, or, or to study um, and, and, you know, saw us, uh, then applied for asylum. Um, and it did anger a lot of British nationals in terms of how can everyone coming here, mm. you know, and it does damage the British infrastructure and its economy and its society. The UK is such a small island. It's it's tiny in comparison to Canada or the US or so many or of Russia <laughs> or Russia or so many of the European countries, Germany, France, um, that we expect the UK to take everything. Now, I agree with that. You know, it's not fair. Um, we have to also look after our own. A surge in, in, in immigration does mean that our health system takes the brunt. Um, people then are in waiting lists for the NHS and, and schools and, and housing. So I, I completely understand that I'm for that. Uh, but I think when it comes to a crisis like this, you've got to step in and, t and, and, and show responsibility, particularly when the burden is on you because of the actions that you, you you took and the decision you took. And, you know, in Britain's case, you left and you withdrew Afghanistan. It, you weren't kicked out. You weren't forced out. You took that decision independently. And as a result of that, the country's in crisis now. So I think it's important for us to make sure that we have, you know, we take our, our moral obligation um, is more important than anything else in, 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 a, in a situation like this. So I would like to see the UK step up, first of all, support those who served with the British government, with the army, um, and supported its mission in Afghanistan. But also those, I think the eligibility in terms of resettlement is, is a bit vague at the moment. And it's not, the remit isn't as expanded as it should be, because the young generation of Afghans who worked as journalists, who worked as teachers, as activists, as worked in NGOs, those people who are very outspoken, very active in the social sort of in, in the public space, those people will be particularly, the, I mean, their, their lives will be under threat because we we went in there and supported them. We we gave them the morale, we gave them the funding, the, 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 the hope that this is the Afghanistan we've shaped for you. Um, and then you take that away, these people will be attacked because they developed under your supervision. So even though they, they didn't actually directly work with you, they became who they are through your support. So I think there's also that responsibility to make sure that those people that uh, are, you know, have become educated and, and flourished in this Afghanistan um, don't end up being killed because not only will we have to start from scratch in the next couple of years if we do go back, um, but we'll also have to retrain and re-educate everyone again because the, the generation that we supported so much have all been lost and, and killed. Um, so I think, generally speaking, there is a huge moral obli obligation now to resettle and support those that, uh, that need us. Shabnam, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really do appreciate it. We've got a few questions for our locals. But before we do that, we always end the interview with our final question, which is, what's the one thing we're not talking about? but we really should be. I think for me, it's making sure that we hear from the people of Afghanistan, not only in inside, but outside. I think too, too much sacrifice, too much time has been spent in the country. And so, I mean, Afghans are the second ranked refugees now uh, population around the world. They're, 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 and they will be increasing now because of this. Um, we've got to make sure that when it comes to the topic on Afghanistan, that we first and foremost hear from them. You know, sometimes these conversations happen. We hear from academics, we hear from politicians, mm -hmm. we hear from anyone and everyone that isn't from Afghanistan, um, from spaces that I've sort of been in. And yes, you, you know, you've, you've said to me that I'm here today and I, you know, you've invited me and I'm an Afghan voice, but one person isn't enough. You, you need a lot more. You need a huge focus on, on the Afghan crisis, not only inside, but outside, because this issue isn't going away anytime soon. 
And in order to find a better approach, if we do look at Afghanistan again any time in the future, you've got to understand its people, its culture, you know, who they are, where they come from, what they believe in. And that's the only way to, to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes we made in the last 20 years. Thanks for coming on, Shabnam. Uh, where can people find you and your work online, follow your commentary, etc.? Um, they can follow me on Twitter, um, Nasi, at Nasimi Shabnam. Most of my work is on there. But um, yeah, and uh, just follow me online. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on. And thank you all for watching at home and listening at home. We will see you very soon with another brilliant episode. And of course, if you're on Locals, we'll ask some bonus questions of Shabnam in a second. Take care and see you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our Locals community using the link below.